Online fandoms have produced a lot of cool stuff over the years, and video games have been no exception to that. In fact, video games produce one of the coolest forms of fan content out there, the fan game. These are unofficial games and established franchises made by fans, either completely from scratch or by modifying the ROMs of existing games. They are then typically released onto the internet for free. Creators make no money off of these projects. They are pure labors of love and appreciation for our favorite franchises. This love is unfortunately not reciprocated by the developers and are subject to frequent takedown notices from companies trying to protect their intellectual property from being violated by these unauthorized derivative works. That being said, despite being generally considered illegal, I intend to argue that these games are in fact a good thing for the gaming space. Part 1. What is derivative work? As mentioned, fan games fall into a category known as derivative work. That is, work that directly takes elements from another and remixes it in some way. For example, a Pokemon fan game oftentimes includes the same creatures, mechanics, and terminology, while placing them within the context of a new story, region, and set of characters, even if most of the time these characters are ultimately just recolors of canon characters. Under current US copyright law, the production of these works is considered illegal as the characters, locations, sprite work, music, and everything else is copyrighted. The only exception to that being game mechanics, as they are considered pieces of software as opposed to artistic ideas. This is why PUBG was unsuccessful in suing Epic Games for the existence of Fortnite. The line as to where a work is considered original is a bit hazy. And I would go as far to say that no work is completely original, as everything we create takes from previous works to some extent. We live in a world where ideas flow freely and make their way into our minds as we consume media. Have you noticed how so many stories rely on the same basic tropes and cliches? There's a reason for that. The artists were influenced by similar works that employed those same tropes and cliches, which in turn borrowed from something else, and then the pattern repeats recursively to the beginning of human history in some cases. In fact, there are entire works that are just straight recreations of older works. For example, James Joyce's Ulysses draws heavy parallels to Homer's The Odyssey, transporting the story from ancient Greece to early 20th century Ireland. Similarly, Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story takes the basic premise of Romeo and Juliet and changes it to be about Chicago street gangs. There are two things that are different here from most fan games, and you probably already noticed them if you've been paying attention. First is that these stories were loosely adapted from works that were written well before copyright was first enacted in 1790. Second is that while they contain the same core ideas, the dressing is radically different. Fan creations, on the other hand, contain both the same core and dressing, and thus the fact that their derivative is much more obvious. My point, however, is to express the fact that nothing is original, so to speak, but rather is derivative to some extent, even if it doesn't fit the legal definition provided by copyright law. Part 2. Is derivative work bad? So there's this perception in our culture that all work you produce must be completely original and to create things that are derivative is the equivalent of stealing. This is based off the notion that ideas you come up with are a form of property that you then own. Copyright exists as the legal codification of this. It ensures that not only do you own the ideas that you produce, but that you are the sole individual who is allowed to make money from them. Originally, this was for a period of only 28 years, and has then gotten progressively longer as time went on, to where it is now 70 years after the death of the creator. The reason for this? Mickey Mouse. No, I'm serious. Every time the duration of copyright has been extended, it's because Mickey Mouse would have entered the public domain if Disney hadn't lobbied legislators to change the laws and extend it. In fact, some may even predict that in 2023, we may see the talk of extending copyright happen again, as in that year, the copyright for Steamboat Willie would be set to expire. This is honestly emblematic of a lot of the issues that I have with copyright law as it currently stands, as this is a massive overextension of what the law was intended to do. It was passed so that creators are able to profit off their work and don't run the risk of having it stolen and sold by others. I'm not on board with the abolish copyright train though, because as a creator in a market economy, 
I would much prefer the guarantee that creators are able to survive without fear of others taking the credit. That being said, life plus 70 years is absurd and serves only to benefit large multinational corporations who will have to contend with others using their characters to tell stories. This is something that is made more ironic by the fact that Disney is the king of adapting public domain stories. Yet, they themselves are seemingly terrified of allowing their characters to enter the public domain. However, I'm not here to debate copyright law. I am less concerned with the legality of fan games, and more so with the ethics of it. I'm not asking if fan games are legal. They're not as the law currently stands but rather is producing them unethical. So to answer the question of the ethics of derivative work, I took to Google, as you do, and immediately hit a wall. There's not much out there on this particular topic. I even tried seeing what the fan fiction community had to provide me, and most of the articles focus on stories written about real people. Yeah, it wasn't a great start. What I was able to find set a few key boundaries as to what you can and cannot do with fanfiction, and by extension, fan games. Generally put, when you put the legal issues aside, communities generally consider it okay to create fan work, so long as you don't try to sell it. It's also really important that you give credit for anything that isn't yours, which is something these games don't ever try to do. They're always very explicit in the fact that the developers do not own the rights to Pokemon or whatever other franchise we may be talking about. Of course, the counter-argument can be put forward that these games are bad because they take away market share from official games, and in some cases are so high quality and professional looking, at least the ones that get takedown notices anyways, that they can confuse consumers into thinking what they're downloading is an official product. This idea is kinda out there, as these games are usually very upfront that they're not official products. There is also the argument that companies need to protect their brand from being damaged by these unofficial products. But there's no reason why that should be a major concern, as again, these games are put out there clearly marked that they're produced by fans, and do not represent the companies in any way. It's hard to imagine the reputation of these large multi-million dollar companies being hurt in any meaningful way because some guy made a fan game that a small sliver of the consumer base actually played. To summarize, while illegal, there is nothing morally wrong with making these kinds of games. You're ethically in the clear to remix the work of others so long as you give credit to the creators and to insist that it's wrong to do so goes against pretty much the entire history of art pre-copyright, as well as Disney's entire ethos for making movies. Part 3. Benefits Now that we've established that it's ethically okay to produce derivative works, I want to move on to why I think the existence of these communities is a good thing. This is going to get a bit personal. I recently graduated from college with a degree in software engineering, with a minor in game development. Do you know where I started my journey with game dev? Fan games. While I never put a finished project out into the world, I put a considerable amount of time into those unfinished projects, and with each one, I found that I learned quite a bit about things like programming and game design. Hell, I taught myself how to code so I could make custom scripts in RPG Maker VX Ace to create a Final Fantasy fan game. And while I never finished that project, projects actually, I guarantee you that without that, there is a pretty damn good chance I would not be where I am today. And it's not just me either that did this. Toby Fox, the guy who made Undertale, got his start making Earthbound ROM hacks on Starman.net. Hell, Megalovania was literally first composed as a song for his Earthbound Halloween hack. If anything, what it shows is that these games can inspire people to want to be a part of something bigger. In some cases, these projects are an intellectual exercise in order to learn how to do a certain task. It's a lot easier when you don't have to come up with everything else and can focus on the one thing you actually want to learn. In fact, AM2R 
an unofficial remake of Metroid 2 The Return of Samus, was made as an intellectual exercise to improve the creator, Milton Gausty's programming skills. Remaking games lets you focus on the stuff you want to do research on. I didn't need to waste time figuring out what the world was going to be. It was just working the overall layout and master levels and the overall game design, and so my focus was just learning how to properly program and scripting. In this context, yeah, that makes sense. My days making Pokemon fan games taught me a few things. In some cases, how to modify and add to an existing code base, which is a really vital skill to have as a programmer, and level design, among other benefits. Having to not worry about making a fully functional combat system right off the bat allowed me to focus on higher level design aspects of a game, such as balance and trainer placement. I wouldn't say that my work is the best, and certainly needed to be tweaked a lot more, but I know better now because of my work on these games. Part 4. Cultural Significance I want to end with something a bit strange, and that is what these works represent on a cultural level, and why I think they serve an important role. In short, these projects either fill a hole left by official releases and show what others view as the potential of these franchises. AM2R may have started as a means of learning game scripting, but grew to what it was because of how dated the original was. It was a way to experience a game that desperately needed to be updated, and before its takedown and the subsequent release of the fantastic 3DS remake, this was pretty much the only real good way to experience Metroid 2. There are other projects that exist solely to fill the void left by the death of franchises as well. Mother 4 was a project created to serve as a rough sequel to Mother 3, after the series creator, Shigesato Itoi, decided to end the franchise. He maintains he doesn't have any more good ideas for a new entry, and that's a fair assessment all things considered. As an artist, while you do cede some control over your work to an extent, after you put it out there, you should only create because you want to, not because you feel obligated to. Since Itoi has no desire to make more Mother games, fans have taken it upon themselves to fill that void. The project has now rebranded and removed all references to Earthbound in order to become its own thing, but this is still emblematic of the role that fans can have in terms of adding to an existing body of work. There are a number of Pokemon fan games that exist solely to create an experience that the mainline games simply aren't providing. A fairly famous example is Pokemon Fire Red Omega which is a version of Pokemon Fire Red that makes the game significantly more challenging. This hack, and others like it, exists largely in part due to people finding the games too easy, especially as Game Freak has focused on making these games as mind-numbingly easy as possible in the name of appealing to children, who apparently have no attention span now. This idea of difficulty extends to the Mario franchise as well in the form of the Kaizo ROM hacks, which create platforming experiences that are on par with games like Super Meat Boy and Celeste in terms of their requirement for precision in your every movement. This is something that the mainline Mario games obviously don't offer due to the fact that only a small minority is seeking that kind of challenge from their Mario games. Since to Nintendo, these games wouldn't be considered profitable on a large scale, it's up to fans to create those games instead. Of course, this dynamic has changed a bit with the advent of Super Mario Maker, but the Kaizo community is still going strong despite that. They haven't all jumped ship to just playing on the Switch now. Beyond difficulty, returning to Pokemon ROM hacks, there's also the case of games doing things that traditional games don't do. This means games without the traditional gym structure, or ones that put more focus on the story. These games represent what fans see as underutilized potential within their favorite franchises and take it upon themselves to do what the devs won't. Conclusion: It's unlikely that despite these arguments, we will see developers ease up on the creation of fan projects anytime soon. Nor are we likely to see any meaningful reform to copyright laws that would be of any benefit to fan creators. But we also have to face the fact that these projects aren't going away. Especially given that, despite all official download links to these games being removed, the games still find their way onto the internet somehow. 
because it's, well, you know, the internet. If you take away anything from this video, it's that these games provide a number of meaningful benefits to both the creators and to the gaming community as a whole. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to leave a like to signal to me that you enjoyed this content. Also go ahead and subscribe and click on that bell icon so that you never miss a video. Finally, feel free to leave a comment telling me what your favorite fan-made project is. And with that, I will see you guys next time.